from around the globe. It's the Cube, presenting innovation for good. Brought to you by Onshape. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante and you're watching Innovation for Good, a program on Cube 365 made possible by Onshape, a PTC company. We're live today, real live TV, which is the heritage of the Cube. And now we're going to go to the sources and talk to Onshape customers to find out how they're applying technology to create real, real world innovations that are changing the world. And so let me introduce our, our panel members. Uh, Raphael Gomez Sverberg is with the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, a very big idea and collaborative nonprofit it was an initiative that was funded by Mark Zuckerberg and, and his wife, Priscilla Chan, and really around diagnosing and curing and better managing infectious diseases. So really timely topic. Philip Tabor is also joining us. He's with Silverside Detectors, which develops neutron detect detection systems. Yeah, you want to know if early if neutrons and radiation are in places where you don't want them. So this should be really interesting. And last but not least, Matthew Shields is with the Charlottesville Schools and is going to educate us on how he and his team are educating students in the use of modern engineering tools and techniques. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE and to the program. This should be really interesting. Thanks for coming on. Hi, our pleasure. For having us. All right, you're very welcome. Okay, let me ask each of you, uh, because you're all doing such interesting and compelling work. Let's start with Raphael. Tell us more about the Biohub and your role there, please. Yeah, so as you said, the Biohub is a nonprofit uh, research institution um, funded uh, by um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan. Um, and our main mission is to um, develop new technologies to help advance uh, medicine and uh, help hopefully cure and manage diseases. Um, we also have very close collaborations with the University of California, San Francisco, Stanford University, and the University of California, Berkeley. And we try to bring those universities together so they collaborate more on biomedical topics. And I uh, ma uh, manage a team of engineers, the bioengineering platform, um, and we're tasked with creating uh, instruments for the laboratory to help the scientists both inside the organization and also in the partner universities do their experiments in better ways or in ways that they couldn't do before. And this edition was launched, what, what five years ago? Uh, is that it was year? announced at the end of 2016 and we actually started operations at the beginning of 2017, which is when I joined. Um, so this is our uh, third year. And, and how's, it, how's it going? How's it work? I mean, uh, these things take time, uh, but- uh... It's, it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, the organization works beautifully. Um, it, it was amazing to see it grow from the beginning. I was employee number 12, I think. Uh, so when I came in, it was just an empty office building and empty labs. And very quickly we had something running that it's amazing. Um, so I'm very proud of, of the work that we have done um, to make that possible. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned now with COVID, um, we've been able to do a lot of very uh, cool work. Um, at the very beginning of the pandemic in March, uh, when there was a deficit of testing uh, capacity in California, um, we spun up a uh, testing laboratory in record time in about a week. It was crazy. It was a crazy project, um, but, but incredibly satisfying. And uh, we ended up... Um, Running all the way until the beginning of November, when the lab was finally shut down, we could process about 3,000 samples a day. I think at the end of it all, we were able to test about 100, on the order of 150,000 samples wow. uh, from all over the state. We were providing free testing uh, to all of the Department of Public Health, Departments of Public Health in California, uh, which at the beginning of the pandemic had no way to do testing uh, affordably and, and fast. So I think that was a great service to the state. Now the state has created a testing uh, system uh, that would serve those departments. So then uh, we decided that it wasn't necessary to keep going with testing in the other biohubs. So that was shut down. Great, um, thank you for that. Uh, now, now yeah. Philip, you, what you do is mind melting. Uh, you basically help keep the world safe. Maybe describe a little bit more about Silverside detectors and, and what your role is there and how it all works. Sure, so we make uh, nuclear bomb detectors and we also make water detectors. So we try and do our part to uh, keep the world from blowing up and make it a better place at the same time. And both of these applications use neutron radiation detectors. That's what we make. You put them out by a port, border crossing, places like that. They can help make sure that uh, people aren't smuggling, uh, shall we say, very bad things. 
Um, there's also a burgeoning field of research and application uh, where you can use neutrons uh, with some pretty cool physics to find water. So you can do things like put a detector up in the mountains and measure snowpack, and put it out in the middle of a field and measure soil moisture content. And as you might imagine, there are some really cool applications in uh, research and agronomy and public policy for this. I right, so it's okay. So it's it's much more than you know whatever fighting terrorism. It's a, there's a real edge or I, kind of IoT uh, application for what you guys do. Yeah, we do both. It's uh, swords to plowshares, you might say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, now, Matt, I I look at your role as kind of scaling the brain power for for the future. Maybe tell us more about Charlottesville schools and and the mission that you're pursuing and what you do. Sure. Thank you. Um, I've been in Charlottesville City Schools for uh, about 11 or 12 years. I started there teaching um, a handful of classes, math and science and um, things like that. But um, the school board and my administration had the crazy idea of starting an engineering program about seven years ago. My background is in engineering, it is in engineering. My master's is in mechanical and aerospace engineering and um, I basically spent a summer kind of coming up with what might be a, a fun engineering curriculum for our students. And it started with just me and 30 students about seven years ago, um, kind of a homespun from scratch curriculum. And one of my goals uh, from the outset was to be a completely project-based curriculum. And it's now grown. Um, we probably have about six or 700 students, five or six full-time teachers. We now have pre-engineering going on at the fifth and sixth grade level. Uh, and I now have students graduating, uh, at, you know, graduating after senior year with like seven years of engineering under their belt and heading off to doing some pretty cool stuff. So it's, it's been a lot of fun um, building up a program and, um, and, and learning a lot in the process. That's awesome. I mean, you know, the Cube is, we've been passionate about uh, things like women in tech, uh, uh, diversity, STEM. You know, not only do we need more, more students in STEM, we need more uh, underrepresented women, minorities, et cetera. And we were just talking to John Hirschdeck and Dana Gray Grayson about this is, it, it, do, you, do you feel as though you're, I mean, first of all, the work that you're doing is awesome, but, but I'll go one step further. Do you feel as though it's, reaching a more you know, diverse base and, and how is that going? That's a great question. Um, I think research shows that a lot of people uh, get funneled into one kind of track or career path or set of uh, interest really early on in their educational career. And sometimes uh, that, that funnel is kind of artificial. And so that's one of the reasons we keep pushing back. Um, so our school system is introducing kindergartners to programming. Um, and so we're trying to push back how we expose students to engineering and to STEM fields as early as possible. And we've definitely seen the fruits of that in my program. In fact, my engineering program uh, sprung out of an after school and extracurricular science club that actually three girls started at our school. So I'm, I think that actually has helped that um, three girls started the, the club and that eventually is what led to our engineering program. So that's sort of baked into the DNA and also, uh, our school is a, is a big public school and um, we have about 50% of the students are under the poverty line. And we, uh, I'm in Charlottesville, which is a big refugee town. And so I've been adamant from day one that there are no barriers to entry into the program. There's no test you have to take. You don't have to have be taking a certain level of math or anything like that. And that's been a lot of fun to have a really diverse set of kids enter the program and be successful. That's phenomenal. That's great to hear. So Philip, I want to come back to you. You know, I think about maybe someday we'll be able to go back to sporting events. And I know when I'm, when I'm in there, there's somebody up on the roof looking out for me, uh, you know, watching the crowd and, and they have my back. And, and I think in many ways, the products that you build, you know, are similar. I may not know they're there, but they're, they're keeping us safe or they're measuring things that, that, that I don't necessarily see. But I, I wonder if you could talk about the, the, a little bit more detail about the products you build and, and how they're impacting society. Sure. So there are certainly a lot of people uh, Dave, who are who are watching, uh, trying to make sure uh, things are going well and keeping you safe that you may or may not be aware of, and, and we try and support uh, a lot of them. So we have detectors that are that are deployed uh, in a variety of uh, a variety of uses uh, with a number of agencies and governments that do uh, that 
like I was saying, ports and border crossings, some other interesting applications that are looking for looking for signals that should not be there and uh, working closely to fit into the, the operations these folks do. Um, and we also have uh, a lot of outreach to researchers and scientists trying to help them support the work they're doing. Um, using neutron detection for soil moisture monitoring is a, some really cool opportunities for doing it at large scale and uh, with much less um, expense or complication than would have been done with previous technologies. Um, you know, they were talking about collaboration in the previous segment. Uh, we've been able to join a number of conferences for that virtually, including one that was supposed to be held in Boston, but another one that was held uh, out of the University of Heidelberg in, in Germany. And uh, this is sort of things that uh, in some ways the pandemic is pushing people towards greater collaboration than they wouldn't have been able to do had it all been in person. Yeah, we did, uh, the Cube did live works a couple of years ago in Boston. It was an awesome show. And I think, you know, with this whole trend toward digital, I call it the force march to digital, thanks to COVID. I, I think that's just going to continue to, to grow. Uh, Raphael, I wonder if you could describe the process that you use to better understand diseases and what's your organization's involvement been in more detail with addressing the, the COVID pandemic? Um, so, so we have, the, the, the Biohub is structured in, um, um, in a way that fosters the combination of technology and science. So we have two scientific tracks, one about infectious diseases and the other one about understanding just basic human biology, how the human body functions and especially how the cells in the human body function and how they're organized to create the tissues in the body. Um, and then it has this set of platforms, um, mind is one of them, bioengineering, that are all technology related. So we have data science platform, uh, all about data analysis, machine learning, things like that. Um, we have a mass spectrometry platform is all about mass spectrometry technologies to, um, to exploit those ones in service for the scientists. And we have a genomics platform that is all about sequencing DNA and RNA. Um, and then an advanced microscopy. It's all about developing technologies uh, to look at things with uh, advanced microscopes and develop technologies to uh, marry computation and microscopy. So um, the scientists set the agenda and the platforms we just serve their needs, uh, support their needs, and hopefully develop technologies that help them do their experiments better and faster or allow them to do experiments that they couldn't do in any other way before. Um, and so with COVID, uh, because we have that very strong group of scientists that work on um, that have been working on infectious diseases before, and especially in viruses, uh, we've been able to very quickly pivot onto uh, working on that. Um, so for example, my team was able to build um, pretty quickly um, a machine to automatically purify proteins, and it's being used to purify all these different important proteins in the COVID uh, virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and we're sending some of those purified proteins all over the world to scientists that are researching the virus and trying to figure out how to develop the vaccines, uh, understand how the virus affects the body and all that. Um, so some of the machines we, we built are having a very direct impact on this. Um, also for the COVID testing lab, we were able to very quickly uh, develop some very simple machines that allowed the lab to function sort of faster and more efficiently. Sort of add a little bit of automation uh, in places where we couldn't find commercial machines that would do it. Um, got it, yeah. So Matt, I mean, you got to be listening to this and thinking about, okay, some, someday your students are going to be working at organizations like, like Bike Bio Hub and Silverside. And, you know, a lot of young people, they're just, I don't know about you guys, but like my kids, they're really passionate about changing the world. You know, you know it's way more important than, you know, the, 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 the financial angles. And it's, it's, it's a, I, I got to believe you're seeing that. You're right, right in the front lines there. Absolutely. Um, in fact, when I started the curriculum six or seven years ago, one of the first bits of feedback I got from my students is they said, okay, this is a lot of fun. So I had my students designing projects and programming microcontrollers, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and things like that. And um, the first bit of feedback I got from students was that they said, okay, when do we get to impact the world? I've heard engineering is about making the world a better place and robots are fun and all, but you know, where's the real impact? And so, um, do, yeah, thanks to the guidance of my students, um, I'm baking that more in now on like day one of engineering one, we talk about um, how the, the things that, the tools that they're learning and the skills they're gaining uh, eventually 
you know, very soon can be can be used to make the world a better place. You know, we, we all probably heard that famous line by uh, Jeff Hammerbacher, the greatest minds of my generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click on ads. And I think we're, we're really, you know, gener gener generationally finally at the point where, you know, young students in engineering are really, you know, passionate about uh, affecting society. I want to get into the product, you know, side and understand how each of you are using on, on shape and, and the value that it, that it brings. Maybe Raphael, you can start. How long you've been using it? You know, what's your experience with it? Let's, let's let's start there. I've been using it for about two years, and I switched to it with some trepidation. You know, I was used to always using the the the, the traditional product that you have to install on your computer that everybody uses. And so I was kind of locked into that. But I started being very frustrated with the the way it worked. Um, and decided to give Onship a chance um, with trepidation because any change always, you know. Uh, causes anxiety um, but very quickly my engineers started loving it uh, just because it's it's uh, first of all the, the learning curve wasn't very difficult at all you can transfer from one from the traditional product to on trade very quickly and easily you can learn all the concepts very very fast uh, it has all the functionality that we needed and and what's best is that it allows to do things that we couldn't do before or we couldn't do easily um, now we can access the the, the, the our cat uh, documents from anywhere in the world. Um, so when we're in the lab um, fabricating something or testing a machine, any computer we have next to us or a tablet or an iPhone, we can pull it up and look at the CAD and check things or make changes. That's something that we couldn't do before because before you had to pay for every installation of the software for every computer. And I couldn't afford to have 20 installations to have some computers with the CAD ready to use them like once every six months uh, without being very inefficient. So we love that part. And the collaboration features are fantastic, uh, especially now with COVID that we have to have all the remote um, meetings. Uh, it's fantastic that you can have another person drive the CAD while the whole team is watching that person change the model and do things and point to things. Uh, that is absolutely revolutionary. We love it. Um, the fact that you have very, very sophisticated version control uh, before, it was always a challenge asking people, please, if you create any version in a part, how do we name it so that people find it? And then you end up with all these collection of files with names that nobody ever remembers what they are. The person left, and now nobody knows which version is the right one. A mess. With Onshape and the versioning system it has, and the fact that you can go back in history of the document and go back to previous versions so easily, and then go back to the present version and explore the history of the part, that is uh, truly um, just world changing for us um, that we can do that so easily. And for me as a manager to manage this collection of information that is critical for our operations, it makes it so much easier because everything is in one place. I don't have to worry about file servers that go down that I have to administer, that I have to have IT taken care of, that I have to figure out how to give access to people to those servers when they're at home and they need a virtual private network and all of that mess disappears. I just simply give a, give a person an account on Onshape and then magically they have access to everything in the way I want and we can manage all our documents and everything in a way that is absolutely fantastic. Rafael, what, what, were, what were some of the concerns you had? You mentioned you had some trepidation. Was it performance? Was it security? You know, some of the traditional cloud stuff. And I'm curious as to how, how, whether any of those were manifested, were they really that you had to manage? What were your concerns? Look, the main concern is how long is it going to take for everybody in the team to learn to use the system, like it and buy into it? Because I don't want to have my engineers using tools against their will, right? I want everybody to be happy because that's how they're productive. They're happy right. and they enjoy the tools they have. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my main concern. Uh, I was a little bit worried about the whole concept of not having the files in a place where I could quote unquote see it in some server in, on site, but that that's kind of an outdated concept, right? So that took a little bit of a mind shift, but very quickly. Then I started thinking, look, I have a lot of documents on, on Google Drive. Like, I don't worry about that. Why would I worry about my cat on Onshape, right? It's the same thing. So I just needed to sort of put things in perspective that way. Um, the other um, the other concern was the learning curve, right? It's like, how easy it would be for everybody to, and for me to learn it. Um, right. And whether it had all of the features that we needed. And there are a few features that I actually discussed with um, uh, Cody at Onshape. Uh, and they were actually awesome about using their scripting uh, language in Onshape to sort of mimic some of the features of the old cat 
uh, in Onshape in a way that actually works even better than the old system. So it was it was amazing. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that, uh, Philip. What, what's your experience been? Maybe you could take us through your your journey with Onshape. Sure. So we've been <clears throat> we've been using Onshape at Silverside for coming up on about four years now, and we love it. We're uh, we're very happy with it. We have a very modular product line, so uh, we make anything from detectors that would go into backpacks to vehicles to very large things that a shipping container would go through. And so, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Onshape helps us to track and collaborate faster on the design. We can have multiple people working um, at the same time on a project. And it also helps us to figure out if somebody else comes to us and say, hey, I want something new, how we can grab modules from things that we already have, put them together, and then keep track of the design development and the different branches and ideas that we have, how they all fit together um, as the design comes together. And it's just been fantastic. Uh, from a mechanical engineering background, I will also say that having uh, used a number of different systems and thought SolidWorks was the greatest thing since sliced bread before, uh, I got using Onshape and I went, wow, this is amazing. And I really don't want to design in any other platform um, after, after getting uh, only a little bit familiar with it. You know, it's funny, right? I, how the speed of technology progression, I was explaining to some young guns the other day how I used to have a day timer and that was my life. And if I lost that day timer, I was dead. And I don't know how we, we existed without, you know, Google Maps. <laughs> so how did we get anywhere? I don't know. But, uh, but so, so Matt, you know, it, it's interesting to think about, uh, you know, some of the concerns that Raphael brought up. I, you hear, for instance, you know, all the time, wow, you know, I get my Amazon bill at the end of the month, it's, it's through the roof. And, but the reality is that, yeah, well, maybe you are doing more, but you're doing things that you couldn't have done before. And I think about your experience in, in teaching and educating, I, I mean, you, so much more limited in terms of the resources that you would have had to be able to, to educate people. So what's your experience been with, with Onshape and, and what has it enabled? Um, yeah, I was actually talking, before we went with Onshape, we had a previous CAD program and I was talking to my vendor about it and he let me know that we were actually one of the biggest CAD shops in the state. Because if you think about it, a really big program, you know, a really big company might employ 5, 10, 15, 20 CAD guys, right? I mean, when I worked for a large defense contractor, I think there were probably 20 of us as the CAD guys. Um, I now have about 300 students doing CAD. So there's probably more students with more hours of CAD under their belt um, in my building than there were when I worked for uh, the big defense contractor. Um, but like you mentioned, uh, probably our biggest hurdle is just resources. And so we want, we want, one of the things I've always prided myself in trying to do in this program is provide students with access to tools and skills that they're going to see either in college or in the real world. So that's one of the reasons we went with a big professional CAD program. Um, there are, you know, sort of K-12 oriented software and programs and things, but, you know, I, I want my kids coding in Python and using Slack and using professional type of tools. Um, and so when it comes to CAD, that's just, that, that was a real hurdle. I mean, you know, you could spend $30,000 on one seat of, uh, you know, professional level CAD program. And then you need a $30,000 computer to run it on if you're doing, you know, big, uh, heavy assemblies. Um, and so one of my dreams, and it was always just a crazy dream, and I would, the way I would always pitch it to my school system, I'd say, someday I'm going to have a kid on a school-issued Chromebook in subsidized housing on public Wi-Fi doing professional level CAD. And that's, that was a crazy statement until a couple of years ago. So we're really excited that I literally, and that, you know, March, and um, you said the forced march, uh, the forced march uh, into, you know, modernity. Um, March 13th, I had kids sitting in my engineering lab that we spent a lot of money on doing CAD. March 14th, those kids were at home on their school issue Chromebooks on public Wi-Fi, uh, keeping their designs going and collaborating. And then, yeah, I can go on and on about some of the things, you know, the features that we've learned since then that are even better. So it's not like this is some inferior or diminished version of the CAD. I mean, there's so much about it that's 
that's better. Well, than I want to I want to ask you that. I may be over my skis on this, but are we seeing are we starting to see the early days of the democratization of CAD and product design? And is the the citizen engineer? I mean, it may be insulting to the engineers in the room, but but is that are we beginning to see that? I have to believe that as everything moves into the cloud, part of that is democratization that I don't need. Um, I can, whether, you know, I think uh, artists, you know, I can have a music studio in my basement with a nice enough software package and I can, I can be a professional for, well, my wife's a photographer, I'm not allowed to say that. I can be a professional <laughs> photographer with, you know, some cloud-based software. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I do think that's part of the, uh, what we're seeing is as, as more and more technologies move into the cloud. Philip or Raphael, anything you'd add? I think, I mean, yeah, that, that, that combination of cloud-based CAD and then 3D printing that is becoming more and more affordable uh, and ubiquitous, it's truly transformative. And I think for education, it's fantastic. I wish when I was a kid, I had the opportunity to play with those kinds of things because uh, I was always building things, but you know, the, the very primitive way. So um, I think this is a dream for kids to, to be able to do this. and. Um, yeah, there's so many other technologies coming on like Arduino and all of these electronic things that let kids play at home very cheaply with things that back in my day would have been unthinkable. So we know there's a, go ahead, Philip, please. We had a pandemic and Silverside moved to a new manufacturing facility this year. I was just on the shop floor talking with contractors standing six feet apart, pointing at things. Uh, but through it all, our CAD system was completely unruffled. Nothing stopped in our development work. Nothing stopped in our support for existing systems in the field. We didn't have to think about it. We had other server issues, but none uh, with our you know, engineering CAD platform and product development and support rolled right ahead, uh, which was cool. I'd also say, know, to, oh, please, no, kind of. To Matt's point, I think it's just really cool what you're doing with the kids. Um, the most interesting uh, secondary and college level engineering work that I did was project based. Pick an important problem to the world, go solve it. And that is what we do here. That is what my entire career has been. And I'm super excited to see, see what uh, your students are going to be doing uh, in their home classrooms on their Chromebooks now and, and what they do building on that. Yeah, I so agree. I'm, I'm super excited to see your kids coming out of college with engineering degrees. Um, because I, yeah, I think that project-based experience is so much better than uh, just sitting in a classroom, taking notes and doing math problems. Oh, um, absolutely. And I, and I think it will give the kids a much better flavor of what engineering is really about. I think a lot of kids get turned off by engineering because they think it's kind of dry because it's just about the math or some very abstract, abstract concepts. And they are there, but I think the most important thing is just that hands-on uh, building and the creativity of, of making things that you can touch, that you can see, that you can see functioning. Great. So, uh, you know, we all know the relentless pace of technology progression. So when you think about, when you're sitting down with the folks at Onshape and they're at the customer advisory board, what are the things that, that you want Onshape to do that it doesn't do today? I I could start by saying I just love some of the things it does do because it's such a modern platform. And I think some of these, uh, some, some platforms that have, a, that have a lot of legacy and a lot of history behind them, I think we're dragging some of that behind them. So it's cool to see a platform that seemed to be developed in a modern era. And so that's, you know, it is the Google Docs. And so the fact that collaboration and versioning and link sharing is and, and like platform agnostic uh, abilities, the fact that that seems to be just built into the, the nature of the thing, so far that's super exciting. As far as things that it, uh, to go from there, um, I don't know, I'll let the other Other guys than price, there. you can't say, you can't say lower price. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so far on shape, PTC has worked with us really well, so I'm not complaining there either. Great, yeah. Yeah, no gaps guys, white space, come on. Let's, uh, we, let's, uh, uh, We've been really enjoying the, the three week update cadence. You know, there's a new version every three weeks and we don't have to install it. We just get all the latest and greatest goodies. Um, one of the trends that we've been following and enjoying is the, the help with uh, revision management and release workflows. 
Um, and I know that there's more that Onshape is working on that we're very excited for, because that's a big important part about making real hardware and supporting it in the field. Um, something that was cool, they just integrated some markup capability in the last release that took, we were doing that anyway, but we were doing it outside of Onshape. So now we get to streamline our workflow and put it in the CAD system where we're making those changes anyway, when we're reviewing drawings and doing this kind of collaboration. And so I think from our perspective, we continue to look forward to, to further progress on that. There's a lot of capability in the cloud that I think they're just kind of scratching the surface on yet. Right. I, I would, I, I mean, you're, you're asking to nitpick. Um, I would say one of the things that I would like to see is, is faster regeneration speed. There are a few times with complex assemblies that regenerating the document takes a little longer than I would like to. Okay. It's not a serious issue, but anyway, I'm, I, I'm being spoiled. By yeah, no, I, I, that's that, good. Right? I, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I, I like to ask that question of practitioners. And, and to me, it, it's a signal, like when you're nitpicking and that's when you're struggling to nitpick, that to me is a sign of a successful product. And, and I wonder, I, I don't know, uh, I have to deep in, dive into the architecture, but are things like alternative processors, you're seeing them hit the market in a, in a big way. Uh, you know, maybe it helping address the, that challenge. But um, I'm going to ask you the big Chewy question now, uh, and then we'll maybe go to some audience questions. When you think about the world's biggest problems, I mean, we're just global pandemics, obviously top of mind. You think about nutrition, you know, feeding the global community. We've actually done a pretty good job of that, but it's not necessarily with the greatest nutrition, climate change, uh, alternative energy, the economic divides, you've got geopolitical threats and social unrest. Healthcare is a continuing problem. What's your vision uh, for changing the world and how product innovation for good can be applied to some, some of the, the, the problems that, that you all are, are passionate about? Big question, but who wants to start? That? I'm biased, but for years I've been saying that if you want to solve the economy, the environment, uh, global unrest, pandemics, Education is the key. So if you want to, if you want uh, to um, make progress in those in those realms, I think funding funding education is, huge, is probably going to pay off pretty well. Absolutely, and I think STEM is key to that. I mean, all of the a lot of the well being that we have today in, in industrialized countries is thanks to science and technology, right? Improvements in healthcare, improvements in communication, transportation air conditioning, um, every aspect of life is touched by science and technology. So I think having more kids studying and understanding that is absolutely key. Yeah, I totally agree. Philip, you got anything to add? Well, I think there are some big technical problems uh, in the world today. Raphael and ourselves are certainly working on a couple of them. I think there are also collaboration problems and getting everybody to be able to pull together instead of pull, pulling separately and to be able to spur the ideas onward. So that's where I think the education side is really exciting what Matt is doing. And, and it, this kind of collaboration uh, in general, when we can do uh, provide tools to help people do good work, uh, that is, I think, valuable. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point. And along those lines, we have some projects that are about creating uh, very low cost instruments for low resource settings, uh, places in Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, so that they can do um, um, biomedical research that it's difficult to do in those places because they don't have the money to buy the fancy lab machines that cost $30,000 an app. Um, so we're trying to sort of democratize some of those instruments. And I think thanks to tools like Onshape, then it's easier, for example, to have a conversation with somebody in Africa and show them the design that we have and discuss the details of it with them. Um, and that's amazing, right? To have somebody in a, you know, 10, time zones away, um, looking real life in real time with you about your design and discussing the details or teaching them how to build a machine, right? Because, um, you know, if they have a 3D printer, you can you can just give them the design and say like, you build it yourself, uh, even cheaper than, 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 you know, us building it and shipping it there. Um, so all that, that, um, that aspect of it is also so, super important, I think for any of these efforts to improve um, some of the hardest problems in the world from climate change to you say, as you say, poverty, nutrition issues, um, you know, availability of water, 
you have that project not about finding water. Um, if we can also help deploy technologies and teach people remotely how to create their own technologies or how to build their own systems that will help them solve those problems locally. I think that's very powerful. Yeah, the point about education is right on. I, I think some people in the audience may be familiar with the work of Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee, the second machine age where they sort of put forth the premise that, uh, hey, as they laid it out, look, the, 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 for the first time in history, machines are, are replacing humans from a cognitive perspective. Machines have always replaced humans, but that's going to have an impact on jobs. But the answer is not to protect the past from the future. Uh, the answer is education and public policy that really supports that. So I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a really you know, great point. Um, we, ha we do have some, some questions from the audience, if, if, we can, if, if I can ask you guys. Um, you know, this one kind of stands out. Um, how do you see uh, artificial intelligence? I was just talking about machine intelligence. Um, how do you see that impacting the design space? You guys trying to infuse AI into your product development? Uh, what can you tell me? Uh, absolutely. Like we are using AI for some uh, things, including some of these very low cost instruments that will uh, hopefully help us diagnose certain diseases, especially diseases that are very prevalent in the third world. Um, and some of those diagnostics are these days done by uh, um, these armies of technicians that um, are trained to look under the microscope. but um, that's a very slow process. It's very error prone and having machine learning systems that can do the same diagnosis faster uh, and cheaper and also little machines that can be taken to very remote places uh, to these villages that have no access to a fancy microscope to look at a sample from a patient. That's very powerful. And I, we don't do this, but I have read quite a bit about uh, how, how uh, certain uh, pl places are using artificial intelligence to actually help them optimize designs for parts. So you get these very interesting looking parts that uh, you would have never thought of, um, a person would have never thought of, but uh, that um, are incredibly light, incredibly strong, and I have all sorts of properties that are very interesting thanks to uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in particular. Yet another uh, advantage you get when, when your work is in the cloud, um, I've seen, I mean, there's just so many applications to that. So if the radiology scan is in the cloud and the radiologist is goes to bed at night, the radiologist could come in in the morning and say, oh, the machine while you were sleeping was using artificial intelligence to scan these 40,000 images. And here's the five that we picked out that we think you should take a closer look at. Or like Raphael said, um, I can design my part, my, 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 my you know, mount or bracket or whatever and go to sleep and then I wake up in the morning and the machine has improved it for me has made it strider strider stronger and lighter um, and so just when your when your work is in the cloud that's just such a really cool advantage that you get that you can have machines doing some of your design work for you yeah we've been watching um, you know this week is this month I guess is AWS reinvent and it's just amazing to see how much effort is coming around you know, machine learning, machine intelligence. You know, Amazon has SageMaker, Google's got you know, embedded you know, ML and BigQuery, uh, certainly Microsoft with Azure is doing tons of stuff in, in machine learning. I think the point there is that, that these things will be infused into R&D and into pro, uh, to software products by the, the vendor community. And then you all will apply that to your business and, and build value through the unique data that you're collecting, you know, in your ecosystems. And, and that's how you add value. You don't have to be necessarily, you know, developers of artificial intelligence, but you have to be practitioners to apply that. Does that make sense to you, uh, Philip? Yeah, absolutely. And I think your point about value is really well chosen. We see AI involved from the physics simulations all the way up to interpreting radiation data. And that's where the value question I think is really important because it's, is the output of the AI giving helpful information to the people that need to be looking at it? So if it's curating a series of radiation alerts saying, hey, like these are the anomalies you need to look at, uh, is it doing that in a way that's gonna help a good response? Uh, and in some cases, the AI, AI is only as good as the people that sort of gave it a direction and turn it loose. And you wanna make sure that you don't have biases or things like that underlying your AI that are gonna result in, uh, in less than helpful outcomes coming from it. 
So we spend yeah. actually quite a lot of time thinking about how do we provide the right outcomes uh, to people who are who are relying on our systems. I mean, that's a great point, right? Humans are biased and humans build models. So models are inherently biased, but then the software is, is hitting the market that's going to help us identify those biases and, and help us, you know, course correct. So it's a, we're entering some, some very exciting times. Guys, great conversation. I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us and sharing with our audience the innovations that, that you're bringing uh, to help the world. So thanks again. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, when we come back, John McElhaney is going to join me. Uh, he's an Onshape co-founder and he's currently the VP of strategy at PTC. He's going to join the program. We're going to take a look at what's next in product innovation. I'm Dave Vellante and you're watching Innovation for Good on theCUBE, the global leader in digital technology event coverage. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.